Okay, hello everyone. My name is Abdullah Al-Asad. I'm a medical student at King Saud bin Abdulaziz University for Health Sciences. And today we're going to talk about acid-base physiology. There will be another video about pathology and we're going to put a link to that down below in the description box. But for now, let's jump into physiology. So, to start, we're going to start with basic information. So, we have acid and we have base, okay? So, an acid is a substance that releases hydrogen ions, okay? And a base is a, is a substance that will combine or attach to hydrogen ions. Okay, so in our body, how do we express hydrogen ions is basically, or hydrogen ion concentration? Well, it's basically through the term pH. Now, the, more, the higher the hydrogen ion concentration, the lower the pH. And of course, the other, uh, uh, the other way around is correct. The lower the hydrogen ion concentration, the higher the pH. Okay, now, the pH of the blood is normally between these two ranges, 7.35 to 7.45. Okay, this is very important to memorize these numbers because later on we need to know in, the, uh, in questions where we, if we're in the normal range or increase or decrease. Now, a pH above 7.45 will give us alkalosis and a pH below 7.35 is termed an acidosis. Okay, now, in our body, where do we get hydrogen ions. Well, basically, we have three main sources. Carbonic acid formation, the major source of hydrogen ions, is from metabolically produced CO2. As you know, the tissues in our body are going through metabolism. So they're taking up nutrients and fuel and burning them down and giving us waste products. One of, one of those waste products is carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide can give us hydrogen ions, okay? Also, we have inorganic acid produced during nutrient breakdown. The most important nutrient we're talking about is proteins, okay? I put that in red because in some questions, if they want to indicate that you're increasing in hydrogen ions in your body, they're either going to say you're, um, you're generating fixed acid by having a high-protein diet or by having a Western diet. These two terminology means, well, you're eating a lot of protein. Okay, well, why protein increases our uh, acid in our body? Well, because it contains a large quantity of sulfuric acid and phosphoric acid. The other and last uh, source of hydrogen is basically organic acid resulting from intermediary metabolism, for example, lactic acid and fatty acid. So lactic acid, for example, in workouts and fatty acid, for example, when you burn down fat in your body. Now, here is the equation of hydrogen ions and bicarb and what they give us and they end up with, as you can see, carbon dioxide. So there's a relationship between all of them, okay? Now, in our body, we have mechanisms in order if the, uh, if the pH goes up or down, we have ways to make, them, uh, make the pH come back to normal, okay? And here are, the three, uh, here are the three main mechanisms for doing so. We have the buffering system, okay? The, the main, we have many buffering systems, we'll come to that, but the main, the main factor or the, uh, the main player in the buffering system is over here, bicarbonate and carbonic acid buffering system, okay? Just to explain how this works, basically is when we have, for example, increase in hydrogen ions, okay? What we want to do is basically the bicarbonate will start to attach with hydrogen ions and give us carbonic acid. Okay, and of course, the other way around is correct. Let's say we have reduced hydrogen ions, so the carbonic acid will basically dissociate and give us more hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. Okay, so that's a way of a buffering system. So the word buffer basically means if, you, if your pH is high or low, it brings it back to normal. Okay, the other body mechanism for compensation is respiratory compensation, and it works by affecting the carbon dioxide in our body. We'll come to that later. And of course, the last uh, compensation mechanism is renal compensation, which works on the bicarbonate in our body. Now, the buffering system is the first line of defense. So we have carbonic acid and bicarbonate buffering system, as we just explained. It's the primary extracellular fluid buffering system. The protein buffering system is the primary intracellular fluid buffering system. Okay. We also have hemoglobin buffering system, which basically says that uh, in, our, in our body, when, our, when the tissue starts to generate carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide goes into the blood and moves up to the lungs so we can get rid of it. Now, during the transport, the carbon dioxide might generate some hydrogen ions. Now, the, uh, now the hemoglobin, what does it do? It attaches to these hydrogen ions so it won't change the body's or the blood's pH. Okay? 
We also have the phosphate buffering system. It's important urinary system. I want you to memorize this because we're going to come to this later. Okay? Now, for the respiratory compensation, which is a second line of defense, okay, we put the equation above here. So we're going to see what happens exactly. Now, let's say if we have increase in hydrogen ions. Okay? What's going to happen? The equation is going to move where? To the left, which will give us more CO2. Okay? Now, that, since we have more CO2, what, are, what is our body going to do? It's going to increase breathing because we need to get rid of it okay so the rate and depth of breathing will increase okay and what about if the hydrogen ion concentration goes down what's going to happen okay what's going to happen is going to we're going to take the most of the co2 in our body and we're going to move the equation to the right so we can increase into the hydrogen ions so our pulmonary ventilation will decrease okay now the respiratory compensation works until but however it works in uh, between ranges okay why is that because we have two kind of receptors we have peripheral receptors and central receptors now the peripheral receptors they respond to the changes in hydrogen ions and the central uh, receptors uh, respond to the changes in carbon dioxide now just to make this uh, just to explain what's going on so let's say we have increase in hydrogen ions okay now, the peripheral chemoreceptors are going to say, okay, we have a lot of hydrogen ions, we should start breathing. Okay, so it's going to tell our respiratory center, start working, and we're going to increase in our breathing. Okay, so we're going to increase in our breathing and flush out some CO2 until the central chemoreceptors are going to say, oh, wait, hold on, we're ha we have low concentration of CO2, stop the breathing. Okay, and that's why uh, the whole respiratory compensation works in certain ranges. Now the third line, of, the third line of defense is renal compensation, and this uh, this mechanism comes a little bit late. It takes hours to days to work. Okay, and the renal compensation adjusts three factors: hydrogen ions, bicarbonate, and ammonia. We're gonna we're gonna explain that in details. So the task of eliminating hydrogen ions derived from sulfuric, phosphoric, lactic acids, and other acids, the kidney is the main factor, or the main uh, player in. Get, getting rid of, of these uh, of the hydrogen ions coming from these acids. Okay, now the kidney normally in normal physiology excretes hydrogen ions. Okay, so the urine pH is six. As you can see, it is way lower than the blood because it usually has more hydrogen ions. We we excrete them through the urine. Okay, now first thing we uh, first part of uh, the renal compensation is in the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, now in this in these cells, what what's going to happen, or what's the main goal? The main goal is to take the bicarb from over here and reabsorb it, so we can put it back into the blood. Okay, and over in the proximal convoluted tubule, about ninety percent of the bicarbonate is being uh, or gets uh, reabsorbed. Okay, so how does that happen? Let's check it out. Now first, let's start over here. We're going to have CO2 and, and water in the cells, okay? Through this enzyme, which is carbonic anhydrase, what's going to happen? We're going to generate hydrogen ions and bicarbonate, okay? Now, each one will go in a different path. So, the bicarbonate will go into the blood, and the hydrogen ions will go into the urine. Why, why does the hydrogen ion go into the urine? Because we need the hydrogen ion to bind with the bicarbonate, Okay, and through also carbonic anhydrase, it will give us CO2 and water. Okay, we turned these two into CO2 and water because we need uh, CO2 and water can diffuse easily into the cells. Okay, so basically what happens is with each bicarbonate we put into the cell, we released another bicarbonate in blood. So basically we just reabsorbed the bicarbonate. Okay, now if let's say this mechanism or this whole system doesn't work, what happens? Well, well, what happens is we can't, we're not going to reabsorb a lot of the bicarb. This is called, or this pathology is called renal tubular acidosis type 2. Okay? Remember that because it's going to come in pathology. Okay? So the next slide over here, we have in the late distal convoluted tubules and in the collecting ducts, the early collecting ducts, we have two kinds of cells. We have intercalated cells and we have, of course, Principal cells. Now, principal cells has an, uh, is another thing, so we're just going to focus on intercalated cells. Now, there's two types. There's type A and type B. So let's talk about type A. As you can see here, it's the same system as we saw in the PCT or the proximal convoluted tubule. 
we generate hydrogen ions, we generate bicarb, bicarb goes to the blood, hydrogen leaves, takes the bicarb, okay, and gives us carbon dioxide and H2O so it can go inside the cells, okay? So the each, each bicarb goes in, one bicarb leaves the blood, as in reabsorption, okay? Now, let's say, for example, we have or, or someone's on a Western diet, okay, where he's eating a lot of proteins, okay, and that's generating in our body a lot of hydrogen ions, okay, giving us acidosis, okay, decreasing the pH. Now, what's going to happen is that the hydrogen ions is going to increase, okay, and then the buffering system will start to work. So the bicarbonate will try to associate with the hydrogen ions, okay, but let's say the buffering system is not enough. So in, in, for, uh, through the buffering system, we're also going to have low bicarbonate because we used most of them to try to buffer the hydrogen ions, okay? So what's going to happen exactly is in the, in the kidney, now when we have uh, acidosis, what's going to happen? Even if we reabsorb all of the bicarb, this mechanism is still going to work. So we're going to generate more bicarb and generate more uh, hydrogen ions, kicking out the hydrogen ions, Okay, and reabsorbing bicarb. What is this going to do? This is going to increase the bicarbonate in our blood, which we need because now, uh, because before we had decrease in bicarbonate. Okay, and since we have acidosis, we have a lot of hydrogen ions, so we're going to kick out the hydrogen ions into the blood. Uh, I'm sorry, into the urine. Okay, so this is going to keep on going to work. Bicarbonate going to the blood, hydrogen going to the urine. However, since we're kicking out a lot of hydrogen ions, the lumen or the urine will start to decrease its pH, okay? And the urine's pH can only get decreased to a certain level, okay? Below, uh, which is 4.5. Below that, the urine cannot go, uh, the urine's pH cannot go under 4.5. So what's going to happen? We need things uh, or we need substances to associate or to bind with the hydrogen ions so the pH of the urine won't fall drastically. What are these substances? The main substances, uh, the main substance is phosphate. Okay, remember when he said the phosphate is a, is in the buffering system of in the urine? Yeah. So once, so it's going to associate with the hydrogen. Okay, and so the pH won't decrease that much. Also, the cells of the tubules in the in the nephron are basically going to generate what? Ammonia. Okay. When we have acidosis, it's going to generate more ammonia. Okay, I was going to generate ammonia so that it can also associate with the hydrogen ions, as you can see here. Okay, now let's say this mechanism over here is not working. Okay, this is going to give us what? A disease called renal tubular acidosis, but this time it's type 1. Okay, remember that. Now, the other type was intercalated cells, type B. As you can see, here's the same mechanism. However, the, uh, the bicarb and the hydrogen go in different ways, or uh, the other way around. See, the bicarb is leaving into the urine, and the hydrogen is leaving, hydrogen ions going to the blood. Okay? Now, in, for example, acidosis and alkalosis, what happens to all of these three cells? In acidosis, we're going to have the proximal convoluted tubule cells and the intercalated cells type A are going to increase in their activity. By that, they're going to kick out the hydrogen ions and generate more bicarbonate and put it into the blood. And of course, the uh, intercalated cells type B will reduce in its activity. Okay, that's an acidosis. However, in alkalosis, it's the other way around. The proximal convoluted tubule cells and the intercalated cells type A will reduce in its activity, and the intercalated cells type B will increase in its activity, so we can kick out most of the bicarb and generate or give us more hydrogen ions into the blood so we can bring back the pH, back to normal. And thank you very much.